Lyons, and I am reporting with Extra Magazine, and today I'm talking with Ross King, the author of Da Vinci and the Last Supper. In your book, you just kind of come out and say that uh, Leonardo was pretty much definitely homosexual, at least from our modern understanding, so why can we be so sure about that? First of all, Freud, who wrote a lot about Leonardo's sexuality and got a lot wrong, uh, said in his 1911 essay that Leonardo never embraced a woman in passion. Um, and I, I, that, I think that is true. There was never any incident in the course of his life where there was a woman, unlike Michelangelo, who by our standards again was I think certainly homosexual, mm. um, but possibly did have girlfriends. Um, but going back into Leonardo's biography in 1476 when he was a young man, 24, mm. he was accused of committing homosexual acts with someone in Florence. He was never prosecuted, he was never found guilty mm -hmm. because his accuser, and it was an anonymous denunciation, um, his accuser never came forward. Mm -hmm. um, but I think culturally in the 16th century after his death it was pretty much accepted that he had been what we would call a homosexual. There's no such term as homosexual at that time. Um, but his relationship with men young man was pretty widely known um, during his lifetime and after. So set the scene for us. Uh, we'll start with Florence in the uh, 15th century. Uh, as far as homosexuality is concerned, how is it perceived by the, uh, by the society in Florence? Florence is interest, a very interesting case because of the fact that on the one hand, it was quite a liberal society. It was maybe a little more like San Francisco in the 70s or 80s and therefore it got the reputation for it being, there being a, a much more extensive, what we would call gay community mm -hmm. there uh, than in fact there was. Mm -hmm. The Germans uh, regarded uh, sodomy as so prevalent in Florence that the German word for sodomy was Florenza. <laughs> and on the other though, there was a repression uh, because in uh, 1400 and then again even more aggressively in 1432, they began prosecuting people for homosexual acts. In 1432, they brought in what was called the Office of the Night. Over the course of the 15th century, in the 70 years or so, that it was um, in effect, 10,000 men were prosecuted. And then uh, da Vinci moved to Milan closer to the end of the 15th century uh, to work for Ludovico Sforza. And would you say, how would his uh, sexual life, would it change when he moved to Milan? Or It doesn't appear to have. Mm. Leonardo had one long-term lover. Um, and he met him in Milan. Um, and this was someone who came into his workshop, um, as, first of all, as a, a fattorino, a, um, a gopher. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he was a very beautiful uh, boy with curly hair, um, a dreamy pout. Leonardo <laughs> seems to have been intoxicated with his looks. He was a badly behaved young man, it has to be said. His name was Giacomo. And, Leonardo quickly called him Selai, which is mm -hmm. Tuscan slang for devil. In some ways, possibly an embarrassment to Leonardo, but Leonardo stayed with him, mm -hmm. and Selai was with him till the end of Leonardo's life. Would you say that da Vinci's sexuality played out in his work? Um, because I think he was very, certainly very deliberate in his work. Um, so would you say his sexuality played into that? Would you say it was at all coded into his work in, in any instances? Maybe the short answer of, to your question of how his sexuality played out in, in his painting mm -hmm. is his ideal image mm -hmm. was of a figure that really crossed the boundaries or the boundaries were ambiguous mm -hmm. between childhood, adolescence and adulthood and then maybe even more so between femininity and masculinity. Mm -hmm. He loved that kind of ambiguous figure. Right. And it's funny in the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown has a character say, Da Vinci was very good at differentiating the sexes. And in fact, the reverse is true. Right. Leonardo absolutely loved playing with that kind of ambiguity, mm -hmm. doing a kind of gender bending in his painting, in St. John, in John the Baptist, in the angel in the uh, Virgin of the Rocks. When you look very closely at them, it's difficult to know, are we seeing a man? Are we seeing a woman? Mm -hmm. Um, what is it? And so I think he loved playing with that, that kind of a figure. Most Last Supper painters follow the Gospel of St. John, which uh, makes very overt the um, relationship between Christ and John. John's the beloved disciple. And in the book I speculate, um, and you can only speculate because we don't know for certain what Selai looked like, but I speculate that uh, Selai could have been used as the model for St. John because this, 
Sally at that time would have been 16 years old, and John is clearly younger uh, than any of the other disciples, somewhat effeminate and probably very beautiful. Um, the, much of the detail on the face sadly is lost. Um, but it's, uh, Sally has been speculated, uh, people have tried to say that the Mona Lisa is a disguised portrait of Sally, mm. uh, which I find slightly hard to believe. I think it's much more likely that he put him in the Last Supper. Mm. And if he did, he would have used him as St. John, mm. the beloved disciple. Right. So would you, would you say that in a way, uh, da Vinci's kind of being reclaimed with all of uh, our knowledge uh, of his life at the time, um, being reclaimed as a queer figure? Uh, would you say that that happens? And uh, do you think it's important that he is reclaimed? I think he needs to be reclaimed, but I'm not sure he is mm. because people are very surprised. I mean, the average person in the street is very surprised. Um, I mean, they might have an inkling that maybe he was, but it doesn't seem widely known. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is, uh, in the Da Vinci Code, there's no mention of it. Um, and also there is a movie coming out starring him where he is a swashbuckling heterosexual hero. And also, um, there, I mean, books have been written recently about him where you know, he is in love with the woman that he portrays in the Mona Lisa. Um, and so he, in many ways, ha um, ha has been reclaimed against all historical evidence mm. as a heterosexual. And so I think it is important uh, that we do look at him in his own right. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We really enjoyed it. Pleasure. Thank you, Michael.